Joining us now is a man who had his retirement sponsored, which, shout out. legendary move. Yeah. Genius move. Shout out to Cuz. Legend at Duke. Been around the NBA. Absolute sharpshooter superstar. Incredible podcast host. Ladies and gentlemen, JJ Reddick. Yay! Yay! What's up, dude? What's up? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how my podcast was, or my, my, uh, my retirement was sponsored. How, how do you figure that? Well, I think, wasn't it like you read an ad read, didn't you? And then you retired. Wasn't it right there on, didn't you do that? <laughs> didn't you do that? No. I, I read my retirement speech on the podcast. The podcast does have a sponsor, Cash App. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, that but I, when I watched the video, I remember thinking it's, to myself. There's a little bit of a jump there is all I'm saying, Pat. No, jump, I don't think so. I'll go back and watch the video and see what I was thinking. Because when I watched it, I literally thought, this guy's a fucking genius. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is a genius. It, it's, it's been amazing, though, to kind of watch your career. Because I'm at the age uh, that I was kind of in college, same time. You're a little bit older. When you were at Duke. In the phenomenon, this guy never misses free throws. He just lights it up from the three-point line. Then there was all these magical stories about what you were doing off the court. And nobody had a clue what was going to be able to happen in the NBA. And you've just dominated. You absolutely took over. You never missed the playoffs. The game translated well. Uh, I'm incredibly happy for you as a fan that has watched on for a long time. And I assume your uh, podcast is going to be unbelievable as well here as you dive full-time into it. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, we're we're definitely leaning towards a basically a full time media role here uh, with the podcast. I just signed up to do ESPN. I am very very curious about the magical stories uh, off the court in college that you referenced. Uh, <laughs> did, did, I am I'm like, what did people hear about me? <laughs> My first two years, I was a buck. I was a wild man. Yes, I was sir. a wild man. Yeah, living. What's up? Living, yeah, pretty good. Living pretty hard. Oh, right? great living. Hard living. Lots of biscuits and gravy at 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah, those oh, yeah. are good. And I think those are potentially where a lot of the stories came from that filtered into, like, West Virginia, you know, and uh, other places where I was. Yeah, I guess uh, they were saying you are dating, like, A-list super Because you were the guy. Duke was on national television every single oh, yeah. night. Yep. And you were this guy who was just flying around, and now you're saying you're eating B's and G's at 4 a.m. You're living the good life. I heard you dated every human in Hollywood that I saw on TMZ. I heard you were out every single night and still <laughs> lighting up the hoop. These are the legendary stories I heard, and I don't know if those are true or not, or, and you can allude to more if you'd like to. I'll, I'll just say some of that is true. Some of that is true. Most of what you just said is true. I, 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 did, I did, in terms of the partying, that's more in reference to my first two years, my freshman year and my sophomore year. I was very sheltered as a child and even as a teenager growing up. And so when I got to Duke and my buddies that were not basketball players would tell me they were going to a, a frat party on a Wednesday night, I'm, I'm like, we can go out on a Wednesday. That's cool. And and Wednesday turned into Thursday, and before you knew it, it was Wednesday again. You know. Yeah. And you somehow still managed to just drain threes through all that. Is it? Did it? Did it affect you at all? And was there a moment that you were like, you know what? I should probably focus on basketball. For instance, I had a moment, and uh, I used to go just like you. I had a much. I didn't have to do anywhere near as much as the shit you had to do on the court or in your life, basically. It was just kicking and punting or whatever. But I went out a lot, a lot, a lot. And then there was like one time where I had a nice conversation, potentially on a, uh, uh, a fungus that grows with my friends in there. And we just decided we were going to flip <laughs> the switch. And I was like, I'm not going out anymore. I just kind of like, I'm going to focus on football. Did you have any of that? Did you have a moment that happened? You were like, all right, I should probably focus more on basketball a little bit. Did Coach K say... Hey, what are you doing? Is that what he said? <laughs> oh, yeah. But I, I needed to be in the right frame of mind to hear. So my entire sophomore year, I behaved, as I mentioned, as a frat kid. I was third-team All-American that year. I was our leading scorer. We made the Final Four. On the surface, it appeared things were well, uh, but I was about 25 pounds overweight. Um, I was missing class. I think that semester I had two Ds and an I. I had an I, which is hard to get. <laughs> it's hard to get. Yeah, it's deep and, down there in the alphabet, yeah. Yeah, and then they so they, they brought me into the office the first week of summer school. I was not enrolled in summer school. I had told my parents I was finishing up that incomplete at Duke, and I had told Duke that I was back home in Roanoke finishing up the incomplete, which in reality I was just crashing at a buddy's uh, apartment off campus, 
and I would get up every day, probably around 2 p.m. I'd go get a burrito at Cosmic Cantina, and then I would watch movies for about four or five hours, and then I'd party. And then I'd just repeat that for a couple of weeks. They tracked me down. They took me to Coach Gay's office, and they gave me a stern talking to it. At that point, I was ready to hear it. And from that point on, that summer set the stage for the rest of my career. I would not have played 15 years in the NBA if it wasn't for that summer. I learned how to be a professional that summer where your day is regimented to the hour. You're doing study hall. You're doing class. You're doing weights. You're doing running. You're doing court work. You're eating right. You're going to bed by 10 p.m. I did that all summer. The next year, I was national player of the year. Uh, so that, that set the table for my whole thing. But, yeah, I was in a bad place when they found me. Oh, I say, yeah, yeah. well, I don't want to harp on that too much. And obviously, it's nice whenever you change your life and change your lifestyle and have that breakthrough moment, and then you see results like being the National Player of the Year. It's probably like, oh, shit, okay, this is good news. You know, there wasn't any doubt in that. Let's go back to when you were sleeping on couches until 2 p.m. <laughs> and then eating a burrito at where? Cosmic? Cosmic burrito? Is that what you said? Cosmic Cantina, yeah. Hey, Cosmic Cantina, great they, spot. They got great fucking burritos. <laughs> Cosmic Cantina and doing it. You think about quitting that? Were you done with basketball? You think is that why you were doing that, or you just needed time for yourself to figure life out? And what do you? How do you think that? Is that what you? It was doing? actually it was actually six months prior, in December, I had called my my twin sisters. They live in Raleigh. They still do. I'd call them over. I said, I need you guys to come over to campus. They met me at. Uh, some chicken place on campus. I can't remember the name of the place. Chicken I think Cantina. it's still there. Yeah. Uh, chicken great chicken Cantina. sandwiches. But yeah. I, they met me there for dinner, and I told them, I want to quit. I don't think this is for me. Legitimately, I think these words came out of my mouth. I just want to be a normal person and write poetry. Think about that. <laughs> normal. Think about that. It's very normal, yeah. It's actually <laughs> kind of poetic. Uh, it's pretty, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Very weird, very weird. So I, it had been brewing for a while. You have to understand something. You have to understand something. Let's let's go back basically 20 years. Actually, let's go back 30 years. I, all I want to do is play at Duke. I spend 10 years working, training, dreaming. It happens. I get to Duke. And I get to Duke, and every fucking person in the country that's not a Duke fan hates my gut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quick. and, quickly. And I'm like, and I'm like, I this is not what I signed up for. And as a your, your your ego structure as an eighteen year old is still developing, I was not help, I did not have a healthy enough ego ego to deal with that, and so I just was constantly looking to escape and cut corners and make excuses, and luckily my sisters talked me out of it, but I still had to go through that whole thing my sophomore year. It sucked. It sucked. Yeah, and I hey, by the way, shout out to you for t I don't know how often you've told this story. And once again, I'm not as good of a host as you, so I, this is probably some research I could have found out all of this stuff, but. I mean, sometimes when you get to the top of the mountain, the view isn't as good as you thought it was going to be. That can be quite a letdown. I'm happy that you were able to turn that around and, you know, kind of, I feel like you enjoyed the hate there towards the end of it. Yeah, you had to have. I mean, people hated you just because you were Duke, you were J.J. Reddick, you were dating all these A-listers, you were partying, and you never missed the fucking free throw. So wow. I mean, that, that you, you just buy into that. And then did you hear what everybody said? Uh, going to the NBA, like, oh, this dude ain't going to be able to transition from college game to the NBA. He can't create his own shot and all that stuff. Is that stuff that you heard? And uh, how did you kind of battle through that? And what did you do in preparation for the NBA? And how has your game changed? Well, I certainly heard it. It's it's hard. It's unavoidable, especially when you're 21 and you're checking NBA draft.net every day to see where you're projected to go. Um <laughs> How much money? And then you'd, I'd go, I'd go talk to teams in between my senior year and the draft, and they would tell me all my weaknesses. And um, I, I always felt though that I had a realistic sort of approach of who I was as a player. And I always said, if I can maximize who I am as a player, which is an elite shooter, uh, someone who's better conditioned than anyone on the court, someone who competes every night, I think that's an underrated skill. It's, you know, I, I like to call it competitive stamina, being able to sustain your competitive spirit night to night, game to game, season to season. I was able to do that for 15 years. That's a that's a skill that not everybody has. Concur. Um, I concur. And so and so I kind of I kind of bought in, especially early on in my career when it didn't go well. I just sort of doubled down on that. I'm a competitor. I can really shoot the basketball. I know I have some weaknesses, 
let me work on those. So what I did was I got I got stronger. I got in even better shape. Uh, I studied film. I learned every nuance of NBA defensive concepts there was. And I decided I've got to be perfect on that end. I may not be able to stay in front of every guy or contest LeBron James shots, but all of the game plan stuff, I got to be perfect. Hey, your form though also. I mean, oh, like, yeah. mm-hmm. I mean, you shuffled like a son of a bitch. I, I don't know if you slapped the wood every single time, but I would love to see you right now go play pickup games at like an LA Fitness, <laughs> you know, and some young like 18 year old kid has no idea what a JJ Redick is somehow. And you just kind of get picked last on the thing, and then it's just like, nope, you're not scoring. <laughs> you're not scoring. See, that's the difference, though, I think. You know, everybody obviously on the offensive side, I assume you're going to be able to shoot forever. I mean, they yeah. say shooters can shoot forever. But on the defensive side, like, that is where people showcase how dominant they are, I think, personally, as an athlete. Like, I wasn't that great of a basketball player. I'll go play in LA Fitness, though. I will shut a motherfucker down. Like, I, I, this is, I'm nowhere yeah. near as good a basketball as you are. So I think you buying into the D and three concept was a smart one. And then 15 years later, the competitive stamina you speak about, how do you try to like give that to other players? Cause it felt like you were almost becoming a mentor, right? I don't know enough in that whole thing. And then down to Pelicans. Yeah. Oh boy. I embraced, I embraced that role. And, and so there was a few get things. Get Zion out of there, by the way. Jeez. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> go on. I'm staying out of that one. Yeah, smart. I could say one. that you. Yeah, I'm yeah. Staying out of that one. Yeah, your words. No, I, I I embrace the role of being a mentor. I think the competitive spirit thing is huge. I, I think having a routine is big too. That was something that I tried to instill in all the young guys that I came across towards the end of my career. I developed this amazing routine. Again, it started probably when I was at Duke in between my uh, sophomore and junior year. Um, but your confidence, your ability to bounce back from bad shooting nights or a, a losing streak, it all comes from that routine and that. It really what gives you that sense of normalcy. Pat, I just want to tell one quick story. I've told this a couple times publicly, but I just love this story so much when you talk about the L.A. fitness thing. So my uh, I think it was my junior year at Duke. Uh, I was dating a girl from uh, Minneapolis. Uh, we dated a little bit my senior year as well. So the summer between my junior and senior year, I went up to stay with her family in Edina, Minnesota, and we went to her local uh, L.A. fitness or whatever it was at the time. And her brother's rebounding me for like an hour. And there's a dude on the side. He keeps watching. He's my age. He keeps watching me shoot. I finish up my shooting workout. I get done. He comes over to me and he says, hey, man, I played D2 at, uh, I don't know, Pembroke State. I don't know the school. But he's like, I played D2. <laughs> he's like, I know you can shoot the ball, but I don't think you can take me off the dribble. There it is. And I said, okay, what are we doing here? And he said, we'll play make it, take it to 11. And I said, great. I beat that motherfucker 11 0. And all I did was drive past him. I don't think I shot a jump shot. Hey, how good did that feel? That had to feel so good. I, I think I've met so like good. I think I've met like six or seven of you, like in my past. You know, like yeah. I threw out football. There's only a couple people that are built the way you're built. Instead of, you know, having that moment where you're an actual student and a human having a good time, flipping a switch, remembering who you are, going on a run, and then feeling that you do have to prove yourself to everybody, basically. Like, I love that. And the ability to continue and sustain doing that is a differentiator. And I, I think every sport's looking for it. So, you probably, were you a football player? I mean, everybody in basketball that's like a point guard or athletic, they always say, especially out of Duke, who's that, Greg Paulson? Greg right. Paulson, uh, yeah. Uh, Sling it. Yeah, hey, this guy, he number one overall pick as a quarterback, too. He went to Syracuse through like 10 picks or something like that. But, like, <laughs> did you play football as well? You can't say anything about that, but I can. <laughs> Did you play football as well or no? No, I didn't play football. I, my parents wouldn't let me. I was I was so skinny as a kid. They just would not let me play football. And then one year, one year, beginning of eighth grade, they were like, you can play football this year. So I'm getting ready. I'm like a month away from uh, you know August training camp, two weeks before school starts. And I broke my wrist. And then I got my cast off, and a week later I broke my other wrist. So oh, football was out after that. And I had broken playing basketball. So I just – football was done after that. I played baseball, though, and I like to joke, Pat, I had a cannon, and there's a good chance I would have been a, a big league pitcher. Yeah. I, 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 I would, there's a good chance. There's ace. a good chance. Probably would have been an ace, by the way, especially with your mentality and mindset. I assume you would have been in there just – just every day, all day. How many Tommy Johns can he get that you broke both your wrists or a basketball player? That seems like that's... JJ, you're an interesting guy, man. The old man in the three, is that weekly? By, how many? How often do we put that out? 
the Old Man of the Three podcast, we put it out weekly. We have a bunch of bonus episodes. I think in year one, we put out 65 episodes, so do the math there, a little over one a week. Uh, we do a bunch of different Check. guests, NBA guys, politicians, entertainers. We just had Gabrielle Union on. Uh, this past week, we had Kyle Korver on. P.J. Tucker was the week before. We do a bunch of different things on the show. We had a leadership series last year that was super fun. Bob Iger came on. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's been a lot of fun to sort of build that, build, build out that, uh, that show in, in this space. I only in talking to you here for like 15 minutes, I assume that that show is unbelievable. I can't wait to check it out. Um, you speak of Kyle Korver, do you, him, Mike, uh, who else? Uh, Ray, uh, Steph, Reggie. Seth Curry. Right. So, do you guys ever just have your own meeting away from cameras and just figure it out who's the best fucking shooter out here? Do you guys ever do that or no? Has there ever been a thought of that? And who do you think is the best shooter right now? Ever. All right, well, so, Kevin Durant so, so to answer your question, no, nothing, nothing formal away from the cameras, but like any industry and any craft, you're competitive against your peers, but you also learn stuff from them. So there's a bunch of guys, whether it's Kyle, Clay, that I've either taken stuff from uh, through film or taken stuff from directly, having conversations with them. But look, Steph Curry's the best shooter of all time. It's not even close. Okay. It's not even close. All right. And I get, mean, get flowers to Ray and Reggie and Clay Thompson and Kyle. Those are probably my other four guys that are in the top five ever. But it's it's Steph, and then there's a, a rung of those four guys below him. Hey, I concur. His shoe game's getting much better too. Those oh, first, yeah. those first couple editions, those things were, those were grass cutters. Yeah, the, oh, nur yeah. the nursing shoes. The, the remember the shoes that came out that looked oh. like nursing shoes. Oh yeah. yeah, you got killed for those. Yeah, but you know he has since. He, and by the way, if you can make shots in those, I mean you're a fucking guy. I think that should <laughs> even be added in there as maybe an asterisk. Also, also shot in grass cutters. Go yeah. ahead, Todd. JJ, after Coach K leaves, do you think Duke is established enough now where like they're always going to be good, or is it possible that they have a couple, you know, dark years here? Like now that he is, you know, not in the equation anymore. That's a great question. I'm very confident in John Shire. One thing he has proven is that he can recruit, and to be a good college basketball team, you need good players, and and I think he's going to continue to get good players in the same way that. UNC had to transition away from Dean Smith. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's probably the most similar scenario here where maybe there's a few years, and hopefully it's John for the next 40, but, but there might be a few years where it's, it's, it's a little bit different. But what the, the brand that Coach K has built at Duke University, I think, will last as long as college basketball lasts in whatever form college basketball is in because we all know it's probably going to change a little bit over the next five to ten years with NIL stuff and – uh, conference realignment, but uh, the, the brand coach is built will last forever. You know, what's interesting is I don't know much about college basketball aside from the money that I've lost betting on college basketball games. The Here in Indiana, they Bob Knight, that era of basketball is still the standard that a lot of the Indiana fans judge the modern basketball to. So, uh, and that's why I think Indiana is such a basketball state is because they like legit love fundamentals. They like love the grit and the grind, like go ahead and run this thing. They love the intensity, the bot and that's how they judge, I think, because of how great that run was on the court for Bob Knight. I assume that's what it's gonna be for Duke forever. It is gonna be yeah. like, hey, this is what the expectation is for everybody, and you gotta get here or get off the ship. It's just, what do you think about the high school kids getting paid now, and maybe these agencies starting leagues? Do you think that's gonna affect college basketball at all, as much as I think it's going to? I, I think it'll actually be better for college basketball, to be honest with you. I think the one and done of the last 15 years, this era has completely uh, tarnished and, and hurt the oh. college basketball product. So the idea that kids now have optionality, whether it's overtime elite, the G League at night, of course, going overseas is an option, but I don't think that's going to be necessary anymore because they can find payment oh. and a market here in the United States. Uh, maybe they stick around college longer. Maybe we, we end up with a team like Duke or Kentucky – having an older team one year. So much of this parody and, and this up and down with college basketball over the last 15 years is because uh, most of the blue blood programs are getting kids for one year and they're out. And there's really not a lot to learn in one year. It's, it's tough. I, it took me four to figure it out. Uh, or maybe, maybe three. You know, so two, two and a half to three. But it took me a while to figure it out. And I had all the pedigree coming out of high school and, and it took me a while to figure it out. And I, I think 
I think if kids can stick around for one or two, you know one one or two more years than just their freshman year, it'll help. It'll help college basketball. Yeah, because, and if they're getting paid, they have a reason to. Yeah, and if you because if you don't get a good class, like the blue blood program could be, you're done. You just one class potentially is all you need in this modern. Because if you get yeah. who's that team over Gonzaga? Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. The Gonzaga has like the uh, the old school mentality. It feels like at this point. Uh, go ahead, Connor. Yeah, JJ. Let's say it's mid April and LeBron and KD they both oh, call yeah. you, and maybe the Nets and oh. the Lakers need a shooter. Is there a chance you're taking one more shot at it, or what? You know what's funny? My wife and I were talking about this last night, and she's like, I don't think you're really retired. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, I can say this. What's the Mike Tomlin thing he went on the other day? There's Never say never, but I can say never. That's me. Like, the only time I will play basketball is if it's with my two sons. I'm done playing. Uh, Yeah, you're not going to let them win. And I'm happy. I'm very happy. You're not going to let your kids win either, huh? No way. Never. Yeah. Never. We play full. Co- we we have this uh, like ca- uh, sort of a caged outdoor soccer court uh, out on Long Island uh, in the park next to our house, and I take them out there. We play full court soccer. Kai, my youngest, is always the goalie. Knox has to score on me. I never let them beat me. We never. <laughs> like we that dominate. kid. Like that kid at Pembroke State, dude. Oh yeah. <laughs> hey, you're gonna get it just like this kid at the YMCA in Minnesota. Go ahead, Diggs. JJ, you obviously played with Ben Simmons, so there's no one better to ask about the situation that's going on with Philadelphia right now. What's your, what's your, just your takeaway for right now with Ben Simmons and the Sixers? I'd like to see Ben playing. That's just me uh, as a basketball fan, because I think he brings so many amazing things to the table. And I, I, I would love to see Philly win a championship and I don't know that they can win a championship without him. Uh, I, I also think, Ben is is not blameless in this, and the Philly organization is not blameless in this. It's it's a huge mess. I hope it gets resolved sooner rather than later. I want to see Ben back on the court, and uh, you know I know he's dealing with some mental health stuff as well. So I just I wish him the best, but I want to see him back on the court. I'm a, I'm a fan of his game. I'm a fan of him as a competitor. I think he's arguably the most versatile defender in the NBA, and that includes Draymond Green, by the way. No offense to Draymond, because Draymond is a defensive genius. Okay. But Ben can literally guard one through five. Uh, I don't know that Draymond's going to be chasing around Trey Young in a playoff <laughs> series, which Ben did last year. Hey, Trey Young's awesome. Uh, Trey Young is, dude. Can we just I, anybody who just embraces the villain role? Oh. I'm rolling with that guy. I'm rolling with that guy. <laughs> anybody that goes right to the star, you know, in the middle of uh, Madison Square Garden, basically yeah. mm-hmm. after getting spit on in the middle of a pandemic <laughs> and going "fuck you," and then he came back to SmackDown. In Madison Square Garden, yeah. and, and bullied somebody that was. I mean, it was just. I, I'm a big fan of his. That next generation. Let's talk about Zion real quick before we get out of here. Okay. okay. And I can't. What do you want to know? What do you want to know? He's my guy. I fucking love him. I I, I need to get him out. Why of Why do you Why do you say though he has to leave New Orleans? He's never on TV, JJ. <laughs> the, the Pelicans are never on TV. Front office. Ever get him on TV? Let's get all the teams are. Making plays right now, right? Everybody's making a play in the NBA. You know the game. I know the game. We know the game. It's superstar-driven league, but a lot of teams are kind of – there's no way they, – they didn't make the playoffs last year. One team didn't make the playoffs. It was them <laughs> last year. I mean, the playoffs are national TV. Two years ago for the bubble, they reconstructed the whole bubble just to get Zion in the bubble, and then they got, boom, right out of that whole thing. I mean, let's let's – it might be Zion's fault. Obviously, I, I've heard rumors about maybe the off the court stuff, but he's not ever going to be on. Prim- he's never going to be a prime time guy in New Orleans, is he? You think? I mean, he is a prime time guy in terms of being on a championship level team. I mean, it, that, that's hard to build. There's 30 teams in the NBA. There's maybe five or six championship contenders in a given season, and there's maybe three or four championship contenders at a time in a given three to four year era. So it's very difficult. That's just about 10% of the teams. It's very hard to build a championship level team in any city, period. Um, you know, I saw a stat the other day. When Zion plays, the Pelicans are still under 500, oh, right? So, oh, you know, shit. some of it is he's 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 got to probably get a little more help, and some of it is he's got to get healthy and, and get in shape. I mean, that's that's not a secret there. With the amount of force that he plays with, jumping up and down, you put you know this from being around the NFL. The amount of force that some of these guys are able to generate, it puts a lot of strain on your joints, on your knees, on your hips, on your ankles, on your hamstring. And 
if you're not fine-tuned like a fucking Ferrari, it's it can be a problem. That car may break down every now and then. And that leads to more problems. How come it's not happening then? What, why won't he, you think? Is he just, he, he thinks he can do whatever because he's always been able to? And he has success on the court. I think he's like oh, shooting yeah. like 80% or something like that. Is that why, you think? Well, you'll have to ask him that. But I would say this. I would say. Put on your I'm, pundit hat, JJ. No, but listen, I, I need to be an old if man if in the three. 18, 19 years old and something has worked for me my whole life, right? Why would I need to change? Yeah. It, 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 in a degree, to a degree, you could make sort of a parallel argument for the Ben Simmons situation with his shooting. I was a high school All American. I was an All American at LSU. I was Rookie of the Year. I've made an All Star game. I've been All NBA. Why the fuck do I need to change how I play? <laughs> right? It's real. So I, I, I get, I get sort of the the hesitation to sort of change, but. The, the physical part is hard, man. And we, t- I, you know, we brought this up earlier. That change that I had to make, and that change that I had to then uh, act out and live for the next seventeen years, my last two years at Duke and fifteen years in the league. That's hard, man. Yeah, that is hard. No and fun. That first time you make that commitment, that first change from going to uh, uh, I've been eating too many. <laughs> Biscuits and gravy oh. and cosmic cantina, oh, you, and yeah. Bojangles. Yeah. yeah, and I'm, I, you know, I was two twenty five, and I started my at the end of my sophomore year. I was starting my junior season at one ninety two. You know how hard that summer was. It was one of the hardest, the hardest three or four months of my life. Mentally too, probably I'd assume, right? I mean, yeah. I, it is not 100%. easy to give that. And, and some people might never understand because I've had teammates that didn't like eating. Like they actually didn't enjoy eating, so they had to force themselves to eat so they could keep on weight. And I'm like, I have no idea how that is how your brain and taste buds operate. <laughs> My taste buds are so much better than yours because I yeah. I enjoy food and I enjoy this and I've had success. It's very difficult. So hopefully he'll buy into the commitment because the entire world deserves to see Zion ball mm-hmm. out. And I can't wait to see and listen to the old man in the three podcast. JJ, you have been fantastic here. We appreciate you. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm glad we got this done. I know we had this scheduled a couple months ago and something came up, so I'm, I'm glad this worked out, guys. Thank you so much for having me on. We're thankful for you, JJ. Hey, it's been fun, man. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. <laughs> All right. Hey, let's do it. Tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. See you tomorrow. <laughs> All right, JJ Reddick. Yeah, yeah, JJ! JJ! So, although JJ was incredible there. Yeah. yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, so good. I'm so thankful. For that. that is not... That is also not the reason no, why people will talk about no. our entire show forever. Yeah, interesting <laughs> enough. I believe in about 20 minutes, there's, there might be a very large conversation oh. in the grand scheme of the sports world. Not that that wasn't, by the way. Yeah, yeah that incredible. was awesome. That came out of absolutely nowhere. I did not expect that. Long overdue. Shout out to JJ. Hey, JJ, thank you, Shout dude. Out. Yes. And to the bookers, by the way. Hey, yeah. Hey, hey here we go. Here we go. As a UNC alumni, I kind of like them a little more now. Zito went to one class on the internet. Spotsy <laughs> <laughs> that was offered by UNC. Yep. Yeah. So he credit, is a Tar Heel. Credit class, credit online course. He's a Tar Heel through and through. That's yeah. right. It's Unless, good we got those rumors cleaned up, too, about yeah. the partying. I had never uh-huh. heard that before. Oh, oh my yeah. God. I had a... F- I mean, I should have asked him about my friend that was potentially with him a few nights or whatever. He ended up in West Virginia, and he was like, you want to call JJ? <laughs> I was but like, yeah. I didn't know that. Is that widely known, though? Oh, I yeah. think so, yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh. Uh, maybe not. Maybe, I, maybe just in my world. <laughs> I, I thought it was, and I knew it, but maybe that is because of I you told heard, you. I heard awesome stories. Mm-hmm. They're, like, they're like, you won't call JJ. He's just like us. And I was like, what do you mean just like us? They're like, he's out right now, yeah. It was, it was like 2.33 a.m. or whatever. And he never answered. Ah, it might have been Eating during burritos. that summer. Yeah, yeah, it might have been ordering Cantina. Yeah. Uh-huh. Cosmic Cantina. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get to a break. Now, why didn't he teach Ben Simmons to shoot, though? Because did you hear what he said at the end? Do you not listen? <laughs> Come no, on. I did. Yeah, he was all NBA and everything. <laughs> but, I mean, he was bit getting slaughtered when J.J. was there, too. Like, but I assume J.J., he tried. You can't, it's not easy yeah, to just be like, hey, I'm your coach now. Yeah. You know, hey, I'm going to tell you. Like, that. He could probably try. <laughs> but also, if something has worked for so long as it has, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of athletes that live by that. I did for a long time. Eating chicken wings and pizza. Drinking a few beers. What? These balls have always traveled very far, very long. I've been doing this for a long time. And then there's all those scientists that come out and say, if you were to eat healthy, your body would perform at a much higher level, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, tell me somebody that does that. They'd say it. And I'm like, oh, I kicked the ball 15 yards further and higher than they do. 
So maybe they should be doing what I'm doing. Send oh, that yeah. message back that way. So that's what they're doing with Zion. He's like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to eat bags of Doritos and drink Mountain Dew for the next six months. No, but Zion probably Come on. has asked either to himself or aloud when they said like, oh, look what this person does, this person does. And then Zion pulls up a clip. Has that person ever done this? No, maybe they should be doing what I'm doing. <laughs> that is, That was hard for me not to say to other people. But then once I got past the stubbornness and the assholeness, and my taste buds being a bit more miserable and I got in actual shape and I got in the, tr like that, I yeah. did become much better. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what those people said back to you, but imagine what you could do if you did what this guy did. Yeah, that's like, exactly the selling point. I'm like, well, imagine what they could, could do. do. <laughs> Maybe I don't want them to do what I'm doing. Yeah, that, that's a hard thing whenever you have always kicked the ball harder, stronger, more explosive than anybody else. And then they tell you, oh, you need to be doing this differently. This is what this person does. It's like, Really? I don't want to be that person. I like being me. It's pretty cool. I could just pop off a fucking 5'5 five five right now if I want to. I don't know if anybody else could do that. And then as I get older, I realize, like, oh, you fucking idiot. All these people are trying to look out for you. <laughs>